Hello, welcome to another lab skill tutorial. Today we're going to talk about uh, the time tagger. First, uh, we'll talk about uh, what is the time tagger and uh, what is the buffer that the uh, time tagger puts the data into, how we can access that through MATLAB and Python. And then uh, we're going to talk about how we can use that to characterize single photon detectors. And then also we're going to focus on one time tagger device where we can uh, synchronize multiple of them to uh, make effectively a larger time tagger. And then finally, we'll wrap up by doing a little troubleshooting and uh, some common facts, some quirks about uh, this time tagger and, and using this buffer interface. So what is a time tagger? Time tagger is an electronic device that records the time arrival for inputs uh, where the time arrival is recorded in the unit of the time bin. The time bin is usually about 100 picoseconds, and then this data is streamed to a computer, in this case, via USB. In our lab, we have several time taggers. Today, we're going to focus on the UQ devices time tagger. So the data that comes from this is something like this. You have two streams where an event will say, OK, on channel 1, time 0, I got a click. And then on channel 4, at some other time, I got a click, and so on. So the UQ devices uh, time tagger, for instance, has SMA inputs. They're 50 ohm terminated. It has two different time resolutions with an adjustable threshold. Additionally, uh, continuous stream rate is only about 10 megahertz, but it can take small bursts of much higher rates. OK, so this buffer. This is the uh, uh, main, main thing that ties all of these together. So the time tagger will put data into the buffer, and then uh, with uh, through the library, we can simultaneously access the buffer with different programs, those being MATLAB, Python, and so on. So now we'll talk about how to uh, create one of these buffers and connect to a UQD time tagger. So you need uh, this time tagger.exe that you can get from the company, and then when you open that, you will uh, select the right time tagger number. You'll increment this for every time tagger you connect simultaneously to the computer. And then there are a couple features I like to call out once this gets started. Here's the buffer number that you use when you uh, want to access the buffer in other programs. And here's the resolution that you need for um, correctly uh, parameterizing what your time bin size is. And then additionally, Here's the uh, current voltage threshold. And down here, you can adjust the voltage threshold between minus 2 and 2. And you can also adjust it uh, to be different for each channel. Um, and after you add a runner, which is what you want to do after you've uh, adjusted all these settings, then uh, you should see a running window. And anything that shows up down here after that is an error that you need to take care of. So to access the buffer through MATLAB, you need to have the compiled max functions. Uh, these max functions are listed here. And you can get those off of our lab server. So if you want to know how to use these uh, functions, the uh, input arguments are listed here. If you run the function, then all the input arguments are listed here. So for example, for uh, the correlation between two signals, the uh, singles counts for each channel on the time tagger, and the coincidences. <coughs> More information about these, type, uh, about these functions is uh, available in the documentation. <laughs> Additionally, a, uh, another function that I wrote um, was a function that takes TT correlate and will uh, find the peak and subtract off the offset so that you are given 
the exact coincidence delay you need between two channels. So this is useful if you have two channels and you want to find the coincidence delay without um, having to do any of the math yourself. This is useful. Okay, so that's MATLAB. And with Python, you can do the uh, same things, but you can also create buffers to and analyze them for post-processing, which you cannot do with the uh, MATLAB interface. So you will need these uh, uh, Python libraries and uh, DOLs for, uh, in the working directory so that you can access the buffer through Python. So um, here is an example of uh, some syntax for how to uh, uh, access the buffer. So you'll create a buffer object, and then uh, you'll call methods on that buffer object to do the uh, various functions that you want to implement. Additionally, uh, we have a similar function, find delay, which will help you uh, calibrate what is the delay for the coincidences between two channels. So let me walk through quickly how you create a buffer and uh, analyze it, put data in it, and analyze it uh, how you want to. So you definitely need to add the uh, right modules so that Python has the functions necessary to calculate everything you want. And then you'll need to make sure to create the channels and t tags arrays with the correct data type. You will need to create the buffer. And then after that, you put the channels and the t tags in the buffer. And finally, you can do the analysis that you desire. OK, so one of the um, useful features of doing this correlation between two detectors is if you do the autocorrelation, where it's uh, one detector, you can actually um, extract some features by your detector. Uh, some of these being the dead time of the detector, the detector jitter, and the after pulsing. So in this case, if we look at the uh, output of the correlation of the detector with itself, where the bottom is units of time bins, then we can see that the width here is related to the detector, detector timing jitter. Similarly, if we zoom in on the bottom, so where this was units of thousands, now we're zoomed in considerably, we can see there is this break where there was no events at all. This corresponds to the dead time of the detector, and here we can calculate from 1694 to 2000 time bins, we have 46 nanoseconds, which is um, the <coughs> dead time of a silicon APD. And then if you add up all these other pulses that happen afterwards, that gives you the detectors after pulse. Now we're going to talk about synchronizing two time taggers. This is useful if you want to uh, have a time tagger with more than 16 channels. And then also, this can be used if you have two experiments where the detection systems need to be separate. Okay, so synchronization requires a 10 megahertz reference clock, which will end up using channel 16 on the time tagger. And then it also requires another channel to be reserved for an offset calibration. There are some things to uh, keep in mind when you uh, make this 10 megahertz reference clock. So keep in mind that the termination is one kilo ohm. There is a uh, specification for what the uh, voltage of the signal needs to be. And also the rise time cannot be too quick. So when you want to use a, the 10 megahertz reference, make sure you click this button before adding a run. So now about the offset calibration. So when you turn on the time tagger, the clock starts automatically. So if you turn on these two time taggers, their clocks are going to start at different times. So you need to send in a signal at the same time so you know 
what uh, time is t equals zero for each time tagger. This can be implemented by taking a TTL pulse and uh, splitting it from its source and sending it down identically length cables to each time tagger to a specific channel. And then you know that when that the time uh, is registered for a signal on that channel, that that time is identical for each time tagger. So to uh, implement this offset, you need to load the data, and you need to search for the event from your reserved offset channel, and then you need to subtract off that offset for each um, time tag. Uh, additionally, if you're going to concatenate multiple time taggers data together into one buffer for post-processing, you need to sort all the time tags so that from uh, each time tagger, uh, if you put all those together, that all of those are ordered in time, and then also don't forget to offset the channels so that the, uh, there are not two channel ones, two channel twos. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about some common errors, some troubleshooting with this software. So again, I'll reiterate, if there's anything that happens after running, it's an error, and uh, most of the time if you see an error, the data afterwards is unreliable. The time tagger may keep going, but uh, if you really want to trust uh, the results, you need to stop and uh, take care of it. So some common errors, a simple one, a buffer overflow. That's when you have too many um, events that go into the buffer before they can be streamed to the computer. Uh, this is simply fixed by restarting the time tagger and the software. Uh, additionally, you can have a pipe error and I think this is a USB error, communication error. And uh, sometimes this is an error that you could ignore, but if you want to be safe, you need to turn off the time tag and restart the uh, connection again. And then finally, if you uh, are trying to use the 10 megahertz reference and you have an error, then you need to double check the specifications and uh, check your signal on the oscilloscope to verify that they match the specifications. I'll um, reiterate that you need to make sure your impedance matched because the oscilloscope is almost certainly going to have a different impedance than the input to the 10 megahertz reference. Okay, and finally, here are some quirks to know about the software that make it a little easier to use if you're aware of them. So the buffer only updates when a new event arrives. So if, if nothing's coming in, it will continually give you the last event uh, that happens. So if you're counting singles and you turn off all your detectors, usually uh, the last uh, the last count um, will continue to show up, even though nothing is on the detector, and it won't tell you anything. So uh, additionally, uh, when you ask for one second of singles counts, it always gives you the previous one second, and it will do that immediately. So if you want to count for one second in your, say, automated data taking, you need to have your code wait for one second after you've changed something, and then ask for the singles. Um, finally, if you're looking at the uh, singles and coincidences, and then all of a sudden there's very wild fluctuations of the counts, especially if they're jumping from zero and then up to some high value, that's usually lower than what they were before. I've seen that often because of a buffer overflow or one of these errors, and so that's where you should stop. Stop touching things in your experiment, nothing's wrong, and uh, restart the uh, time tag. Um, additionally, uh, this is one of the most common errors I see when people start to use the time tagger, is they're not uh, very careful about the function inputs. Some of these inputs are in the units of seconds, and some of these are in the units of time minutes. And uh, if you mix that up, you will get very unreliable and weird results. And uh, all this is specified in the function declarations and the documentation, so you just have to be, be careful. Um, and finally, uh, as you know, MATLAB and Python, and C++ for that matter, index arrays differently. So uh, be careful when you are getting uh, time tag data from these interfaces. The channels will be indexed differently, but 
if you're in these functions and you want to access a channel, it's always zero indexed. In conclusion, we talked about uh, how some how these what is a time tagger and how to connect to it via this buffer object, how we can access it from multiple programs. Also, we discuss there's some post-processing that you can do in Python, and we discussed how to synchronize multiple time taggers. Thank you.